Hello and welcome to the School of Continuing Studies Let's Get to Know series. My name is Carmen Cecilia. I am Associate Professor and Director of Indigenous Relations Initiatives at the School of Continuing Studies. I'm pleased to welcome Indigenous artist Owizogun Laash with us. Good morning, Carmen. <laughs> Good morning, Owizogun. <laughs> welcome. I'm so glad that we've had this opportunity to sit down and uh, have this conversation. Let's start off by you telling us a little bit about yourself. Well, I've been an artist ever since I can remember. I basically started before I was 12 because at 12 I had my first exhibit and I also participated in Expo 67 with a live drawing uh, on site. So since then I've been painting, drawing. I do a little bit of all uh, Iroquois arts and crafts. I create our, or recreate our uh, material culture and as well, I do a lot of oil paintings that tell the story of who we are and how we got to where we are now. Uh, my home is on the traditional territory of the Iroquois. We are on the south shore of Montreal, Kahnawake. I've been there my whole life. I've traveled around the world all over, but there's no place like home. Kahnawake is Iroquois territory. It's a part of the Five Nations, uh, now the Six Nations, Iroquois Confederacy. Uh, I've always lived on the reserve. My, my people have clans, a clan system, matrilineal clan system, which uh, really revolves around how we do our governance and how we know our limitations and, and how we live as a society. So in Ganawage, we have three basic clans. We have uh, bear, wolf, turtle, which are uh, divided into three subsets within each one. So for example, with my clan, turtle, we have box turtle, we have snapping turtle, and painted turtle. So each of those represent different families. So you know who your relations are, mm. you know who you're allowed to marry and who you're not allowed to marry, you know uh, who to go to see in uh, as your representative, so who the chiefs are, and the clan mothers who uh, help to make sure that all of the governing of the business is done in a, in a good, cohesive way. Wonderful. And the Mohawks would sit in a grand council, which is all representation from all of the different nations within the Confederacy. So we have nine seats in there. So why don't you tell us a little bit about um, what this, uh, the meaning of this painting is and the story behind it. 1492. Wow, oh, you're, you're really <laughs> taking me back. <laughs> Christopher Columbus arrived in Canada or what is now called Canada. And he more or less opened the door for a lot of other nations to come. Uh, at that time, the people were not sure about who these visitors were. And we always looked at, at the people coming over the waters as visitors because they would leave. And sometimes new ones would come back and then eventually what happened was they started making settlements. And by the 1600s, early 1600s, we realized that we really needed to have some kind of treaties with them because there was no treaties, so there was no rule on how to engage between our government and their governance. And so when you look at the, the painting, you see the two rows of... Uh, darker waters right here and here yes so those are representing the path of our our nations how we do our governance how we work to together or separately independently really of each other and so when the dutch came we said well we need to have some kind of treaty so it was the two wampum is the name of this um treaty and it was the working relationship between two governments and so you have 
uh, reflected in the, the, the water is the boats that the Europeans were on and other colonization people. And the one at the bottom is the native people that were across Canada. So when we made the Tour Wampum Treaty, it was initially be between the uh, Iroquois and the Dutch. However, all of the Canadian government now uh, agreed that this was a good treaty for them to work with us because what it did is it made uh, very clear, though these are your rules, your laws, your um, method of doing things. We have our own. Like earlier I spoke about us having chiefs and clan mothers. We have, in our confederacy, we have 50 chiefs. Each represents the nations. Each of those 50 chiefs have a role. For the Mohawks, we have three chiefs, one representing the bears, the wolves, and the turtles. And each of those chiefs have a woman that stands behind uh, them. And the chiefs don't make the decisions. The people make the decisions. The chiefs are the ones who relay the message. That's their job. The clan mothers are the ones that organize the people and have a good uh, discussion about what is the issue on the table. And she's the one that makes sure that everyone has their say that sits under her particular clan. So for example, the, for, the, for the turtles, so we have a turtle clan mother. For the wolves, we have a wolf clan mother. And for the bears, we have a bear clan mother. So they gather the voice of the people. Then the decisions are passed back and forth until we get a uh, clear consensus of what we want to do. There's no voting. It's strictly consensus. And so once consensus is made within each um, of the clans, they are brought together as the nation. And then the chiefs bring it to what we call Grand Council, which is the 50 chiefs gathering together to make the decisions and to pass the decisions that were made um, after discussion with all of the nations go through the same mm -hmm. the same concept and so we have that we still have that today and so w I would say uh, a large portion of our people still follow that road and the way that we have been doing things we look at all of the other nations across Turtle Island and um, right to BC and we all have our traditional governance still and so because we have a strong, that part of us is strong and has never been um, decolonized out of us, we still follow this tenet of the two row wampum. So if we take a look at this wonderful painting right here, what title did you give it? The painting is called Navigating Our Paths. And it's given that name because we are still on that road working together side by side, but not crossing each other's path. The other thing I wanted to say about this wampum belt was that Canada accepted this belt, but they changed the name. The, all the tenants are still the same, but they call it the Silver Covenant Chain. And in the agreement with Canada, it was said that we would regularly come together to polish the chain, meaning that we would renew all our agreements together. Uh, the last time that they did do the polishing of the chain was, oh, about 15 to 20 years ago. And they had these special commemorative coins that were mm -hmm. made called polishing the chain, and they were gifted to the chiefs that attended the ceremony. Mm -hmm. In 2021, McGill University, the School of Continuing Studies, commissioned you to, to uh, do two pieces of art. We've got them right here. Talk to me about this one. The colors are absolutely wonderful, and it inspired me to wear color today. <laughs> uh, what is the title of this painting? It's called Dancing Across Turtle Island. It's basically talking about how there's so many different 
nations that are living on Turtle Island. Uh, I know for many years people thought that uh, all natives had long hair, all dressed in leather, all had that pan Indian type of uh, like with the war bonnet and and like that. And that's what this is about. So you have clothing from different nations across uh, Turtle Island and including like the Innu. You have the Tinglet from BC. You have the Plains Cree. You have uh, Mi'kmaq, Iroquois, uh, Metis as well. And I have a child in there because the children themselves all know their, how they're supposed to dress and wear. And today we have a big resurgence with uh, ribbon skirts. Mm. So a lot of the nations are saying, okay, well, that's part of our culture now, mm -hmm. which it's, it is. And so a lot of women are, are getting, um, getting their ribbon skirts and wearing them more regular. And that's part of uh, our te in our teachings that, you know, they'll see the women all have skirt. Mm -hmm. And that's because it's uh, women are the life givers. We're the ones that create people. We're the ones that make sure that we raise our children to know their culture, their language, their history, and understanding that even though we're all, we're all different nations within the, the native people, we have some things that are similar and there's a lot that is, is uh, done differently also based on where they live. So and you're a lifelong learner. You're continuously absolutely. learning. Absolutely. At the School of Continuing Studies, yeah. we believe that one learns till at their very end of life. And um, when I look at this painting, I'm sort of wondering, can you see a, a lifelong learning when in this painting? Absolutely. In what when I look at that, I'm reminded that even though all of our nations are a little bit different, we are still learning and and recouping some of the energies, and um, a lar a large portion of that comes from our elders. And there's a time in our life where we get to that point of what we call the giveaway. And that's like when you're starting to teach everybody else everything that you know, so that they can carry that on to their children, their grandchildren, their great grandchildren, seven generations that need to be reminded of where they came from and where they're going and still being able to function in today's society. Like, although I follow my traditional culture and uh, I'm learning still some things like I still need to finish learning my language, but there are some things that are considered sacred that are not shared to the general population. There's a small group of people that are knowledge keepers of that. And we try to make sure that the next generation are gaining that knowledge so that it's not lost. And that's like the lifelong learning that all the native people have the, that, uh, it's part of our DNA knowledge. Mm -hmm. It's a uh, part of our, our cellular memory that these are things that we need to still do. We still need to give thanks for everything that we've been gifted in the world, yeah. you know, and it's important that other people are, learn, learn as well that being grateful for everything that you have is the tenet of life. It's the, it's the, the whole meaning of life is, is understanding that being grateful, no matter what it is, you could be sick and dying, but there's still something to be grateful for that you had a life that provided you with whatever, mm -hmm. you know, that you needed mm -hmm. and family and friends and the choices that we make when we're walking on Turtle Island is forever going to influence not just the people, but the land. Obizogong, it's been absolutely a pleasure talking to you today. Well, thank you very much for inviting me.